and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, formerly creator of OS plus R, Obelets, Sorcery, and Reavers, and now the upcoming creator of the of the Cyberpunk OSR DIY g game Neon Blood, the one and only M. Scott Welker. How are you doing tonight, <laughs> man? Not too bad. Thanks for having me back. Thanks. I wanted to put up with my shenanigans. <laughs> are you ki Are you kidding? Have you seen Have you seen how thing Have you seen how things get in the temple? Shenanigans are <laughs> are expected. If they don't happen, then I feel like I haven't done my job. There you go. So, I do, I do want some credit. I do want some credit in both in both of our in both with OS Plus R and with this in the fact that I have gone this entire time without making one walking in Men walking in Memphis joke. <laughs> oh man, I think that surprises people a lot. You don't hear a lot about Memphis going on in the gaming community. Um. I've, I've done, given the fact that one of my one of my first board game experiences was where was, where in the USA is Carmen San Diego, um, <laughs> I had a bit of a habit of do of doing, of doing nation trotting or glo or globe trotting adventures when I do more contemporary style games. Um, obviously it's harder to do that kind of thing with Cyberpunk because with Cyberpunk you're always in that city. I've made comparisons to the to the uh, lab to the minotaur's labyrinth when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the setting of a cyberpunk city yeah it's just that instead of a minotaur the minotaur in this case is the corpse <laughs> yeah fair enough but with now the, now um last time i had you on you had hinted that this was being being in develop being in development and was Neon Blood something that you ended up kicking around shortly after finishing OS Plus R, or was it in the was it in the can for longer? Uh, yeah, longer. So <clears throat> I kind of had the idea, but I didn't really. I wasn't thinking too much about it. Uh, there was a few other projects I wanted to get to, and then there was a. I don't know. I just started thinking about oh, about the OSR community in itself, and it, it's almost. 99% Dungeons and Dragons, right? Some clone of D&D &D mm -hmm. with a few tweaks here and there. So I was like, you know, man, my Neon Blood, because originally I was I was looking at doing a Savage Worlds. I'm a licensee mm -hmm. for Savage Worlds. But that that's also crowded out now with, with something. And I was like, I want to give people who like this baseline D20 system something fun and bring my you know zaniness of how I approach the rules uh, and kind of give them some gunplay. And then there was another product that came out that was a future setting. Mm -hmm. Science fiction, I read through it, and I was, you know, again, the ego will get you, and it's just like, oh, this is interesting, but I can do better than this. <laughs> so here we are. Um, fortunately, I, you know, I, I, tell, I tell I work at home now, and my job doesn't keep me overly occupied, and so I can write uh, in the afternoons and the evenings, and it's just me and my wife, and she doesn't really care. She thinks it's funny that, you know, I get excited about making, you know, a couple hundred dollars off of a uh, nerd shit. So, mm -hmm. um, now what? Now, um, obviously, there, obviously, there's a lot of differing opinions when it comes to OSR, and I've, I've had my own takes. You've had, you, you've had your, you've had your <laughs> takes. We've um, shit talked other people's <laughs> takes because um, I hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. <laughs> True, but. I want to get into this on, into the term that you use on the Kickstarter page, "dirty OSR." What exactly does that entail, dude? I had to make that up because I was like, "What is it that I?" Because I was thinking about the conversation we had, and I'm like, and then other people who get real snooty, nose in the air about OSR, and I'm like, "Okay, check. It's not really OSR because it's not you know Dungeons and Dragons with guns." And I'm like, "The DIY the DIY movement is pretty baller because you got some cool hacks out mm -hmm. there." And I'm like, and they kind of play with the rules, and so I'm like what do you call the system that is a little bit DIY 
and a lot of OSR grounding, but you really just get in there and shake the shit out of it and kind of break paradigms of how of how the game can work without getting too zany uh, or just ridiculously overpowered. And I was like, oh, fuck it, I'll just call it Dirty OSR, uh, and we'll see what sticks. Yeah. And when... when now, um... I think now you've had you've had your own. You've mentioned the whole thing of it of so much of a focus so much of a focus with OSR is on is on D and D. But is that is that part of the reason why um you why you declared that you are not a retro clone in the book? Yeah, in the well, Kickstarter, in the Kickstarter page, yeah, let me clarify. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that and you know how gamers get, man. There is no more pedantic audience than nerds and god help you if you claim to be osr or, or a retro clone or you don't tell someone you're not a retro clone because jesus they're gonna let you know about it on the kickstarter and the feedback and then it's just like okay i'm gonna cut to the chase and i want you to know up front what you're getting mm -hmm. you know and now what now I've um I've had my fair share of cyberpunk people on the show. In fact, I did a whole panel about it last year. And what I'm curious about for you is what was your first introduction to cyberpunk? And to you, what is the appeal of cyberpunk? Oh, man, solid. So, man, I've got to really think about this to be fair. I think my first introduction to cyberpunk was probably snow crash and but too young to really get it right you're reading a lot of stuff and the, the internet was still so young anyway and it's just these ideas of the information superhighway and how you jack in and to ride the virtual metro right you're creating you're basically scripting your your motorcycle or your bus or whatever um in order to take the transit the trolleys and it was still kind of weird for a younger kid um and then like uh, Blade Runner hit, and then that was also probably too advanced for for a younger audience. And then just started really getting into it. Uh, Red uh, Neuromancer, I, I definitely didn't understand that at first because um, it throws you for a loop if you're not following Winter Mute closely. Mm -hmm. um, but then, um, yeah, we just went from there. And for the appeal of cyberpunk, I don't. I think it's just uh, for me. I, you know, I grew up skateboarding. So I've always been actual true punk rock anyway. You know, I was a kid with the long, long ass hair, colored hair, anarchy t-shirts, you know, just ridiculous things, causing trouble, starting fights. But um, looking at the inevitable march of man's decline into dependency on technology to where we're, we basically beg the machines to do shit for us. Mm -hmm. um, and just the miracle of watching a world potentially crumble around us because we're satisfied with being tied down and becoming the product, even though we still believe that the products are for us, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will admit I've, um, I've remarked, a f I've remarked a few times that I, f I think a lot of people's take on cyberpunk is, I think the phrase I used was too much cyber, not enough punk. <laughs> yeah. Um, large, largely because of the fact that for me, um, I've, as I've um, referred to myself as a TRPG punk and while, I, while I certain, and while I certainly have a leather, while I certainly have my fair share of leather jackets, I'm not going to be doing mohawks and, um, my hair is curly. So if I grow it out, I'm just going to have a giant ass Afro that's so big, it's going to, it's going to create its own or its own uh, field of gravity. Yeah, that's baller though. I did that once, and I'm never doing that again. <laughs> no, 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 no black power fist fucking pick or anything, just hanging out? <laughs> no. no. Um, one, one, is, uh, one, the whole, the whole thing is cheesy. Two, um, I'm not, two, um, you do not have enough money to make me wear bell bottoms. <laughs> oh, man. One day, one day. <laughs> the only way I'm doing that is if I'm getting paid and if I'm getting paid handsomely and you don't have that kind of cash. <laughs> hey, look, this Kickstarter is doing pretty well for a, a, a douchebag in Memphis right, <laughs> sitting in his office. How much does it take to get you in bell bottoms? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you're, I think you're going to, I think you're going to need some EA money or some shit like that. Oh man. <laughs> 
God. Plus that. Plus, then you'd have to explain to all the backers that you just blew the whole budget on on daring some <laughs> jackass in Minnesota to wear bell bottoms. I'm like, it was worth it. It was all a scam. It was a ruse. <laughs> but, oh man. When but um, given that and give and given that there's no shortage of um cyber of cyberpunk themed um pro, um projects yeah. in the la- in the last year. And I know some. I know some people will po- will point to um 2077 for that, but I'd say I'd say um that wasn't. I'd say the amount of cyberpunk games that you're seeing nowadays is just a little bit more inev- was a little bit more inevitable. Sure. Um, it was just it was just a matter of needing t- needing a different kind of image spe- so it doesn't get stuck in the 80s. Which, yes. But. What I'm curious about, what I'm curious about with Neon Blood in this case is, what are what are people going to find familiar, and what are and where are you veering off to the left when it comes to your take on Cyberpunk and your take on the D on um, well, just the old school D and D, just the old school D twenty system. I I was about to say D and D, and then I had to correct <laughs> myself. <laughs> no, it's good. Uh, so for the Cyberpunk side of it. Um, when you're going through, so instead of this shattered shithole dystopia that I think is most prevalent, Mm -hmm. right. In a lot of cyberpunk that, you know, those areas are definitely present, but if you go through the gazetteer that's included, you know, before the character creation section, I, I reference it right away that it's, it's a gilded cage dystopia, you know, it's not pristine and beautiful. Like you'd see in a show like, uh, almost human. Right. Um, but it's kind. Of, you can feel our world just with you know holosynth adverts jumping out at you if you're not controlling your ad blockers with mm-hmm. whatever uh, means you have of of connecting to the broader internet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so there's it's it is that gilded cage, and you don't really realize that the decline has already happened. I mean, you know, you look at the world setting; it's completely different than what we currently have now. But I've had people give me feedback, and they were just like, you know, like this is this is the kind of shit that could happen right when you start seeing these um, small breakups occur uh, and these um, uh, some of the conflicts that arise out of that and some of the necessities. Um, so I think that's the, the bigger difference is like you shouldn't, you shouldn't pick up neon blood thinking you're going to, you know, be doing crazy wheelie jumps over uh, rubble strewn cities. That's more apocalyptic for, in, in my opinion. Yeah, this is, it's, it's just, it's our world slightly advanced to 2035 you know they have perfected nanotechnology cybernetics are real they are nearly ubiquitous but not as ubiquitous as i think a lot of games make them um and we address that by having an uncanny the uncanny valley uh factor that's still in there Mm -hmm. uh for the characters and use you interact with folks so yeah i think that's a big difference it it really is like it's a gilded it's a gilded dystopia yeah um you know and then as far as the how it separates itself mechanically, uh, man, Jesus, there's, I'd like to say there's quite a few little tricks that I've put in here. Um, you know, it uses a skill set, which you don't really see with OSR, but the skills are kept down to 20 skills mm-hmm. that are broad in principle instead of myopically focused. Um, so we're not dealing with the Shadowrun skill list. <laughs> right, yeah, no, or role master, right? I don't want eight pages of a character sheet because it really is. Like, if you're abstracting armor and you're abstracting hit points, you can also then learn how to abstract skill sets. You know, like, so one of our skills is handle. Well, handle can let you fly a drone, drive a car, ride a motorcycle, do a boat, fly a helicopter, or, you know, in this case, they're actually a quadcopter, large drones that you pilot. Um, You know, and some people have a hard time with that, you know, but it's just like, just think about it and go beyond needing 15 fucking skills to cover your vehicle. Who cares? The most important piece is how you're crafting the narrative around your character, and we get it. Yes, theoretically, your your drone jockey who's a punk and likes to jump in cars and hotwire him, he could theoretically fly a jet fighter, Mm -hmm. but that's also on the GM. Okay, we'll make this a disadvantage, make the check so impossibly high, right, to reflect that instead of just saying, oh, I guess you can just fly fighter jets now. No, don't do that, right? And so that's the one area of skills. Um... How we handle armor is a little different. Armor has a protective value, and then your armor goes away, right? But it's also player-facing choices of how we do business in the system. And as you saw, and if it, I don't know how far you got through some of what I, I, I let you see, is uh, a lot of the system 
is player facing and how you have your successes and how you have your failures are going to be up to the people at the table and not necessarily the GM. The GM presents the story, runs the scenarios, and the players have to decide, hey, am I using my armor now or am I not using my armor now? Where am I at? Where are we at in the middle of this run? And can we survive if I start burning through my armor? Um, and then um, the initiative is probably the biggest departure from D and D games, and that's really what started the impetus of Neon Blood for me. Was I wanted a, an initiative system that was out there, but was playable and would provide that verisimilitude of a frenetic two-way range, mm -hmm. but would also allow simultaneous hacking to occur and not make everyone bored at the table. And so you got our our initiative system, mm -hmm. which it sounds weird to describe it, but once people play it. Uh, I've had nothing but positive results, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't know. There's probably, go ahead. I'm, there's, there's a few other ways, you know, we depart, we try to add a little bit of things in here and there, but yeah, cover works differently than in most games. Uh, but yeah, go ahead. Fire away. I do. I do want to focus on initiative because in your, <laughs> in the last thing that we talked about with you with, um, OS plus R, you had initiative uh -huh. as, um, as these die roll based actions where yeah. you were, you were counting from, you're counting from the bottom up based yep. on what they um what the action that someone was taking yes yeah. and yep i ended up i ended up liking that because instead instead of the assumed guarantee of an action people had to think about oh okay do i want do i want to act do i want to act now and do and do something that's not going to be as effective as acting late or do i want to act late and ri and risk the quick guy is hitting me right yeah yeah a choice everything's a choice right in os and r <laughs> yeah <laughs> And that carries over. But what's your question on the initiative here? What do you want oh. to talk about? <laughs> the the uh, main the main one is what is um use is first off the use of a D twelve that, that I noticed, and second uh -huh. off, um how how does how does that a uh, whole two way firefight fe feel um represent itself within um, Neon Blood's um, initiative system. Okay. So for... So because you and I are probably the only two people listening that currently know. So I'll describe the initiative system real fast. Yeah. Um, so you... Everybody rolls initiative. It's a D12. The GM is... It's told. It, it's in the book. The GM should separate the op four into small groups, right? So if you got two or three on one side, two or three on the other. And then leader types or bruiser types roll their initiative separately. So you add in uh, reaction uh, as a bonus. Your reaction is a derived skill that is your dexterity plus wisdom cut in half, right? Because your perception counts in a firefight and in how shit goes down, and so does your ability to respond to that perception. So we combine that cut in half, make it a derived stat. So it's a D12 plus your reaction uh, plus any miscellaneous modifiers you might have. Like if you have side, there's some cyberware that pumps up your your dexterity bonus, which will add into your, your, your overall reaction bonus when it's calculated initially. Um, and then there's uh, the musco-skeletal uh, regulators, which is a fancy way of bringing wired reflexes into the system. And those actually, for every tier that you have in those, and the tier three is the max tier for cyberware, for guns, for all the things in the game, because we wanted to have a bounded accuracy, right? Like the mm -hmm. edition has kept. Yeah. So for every tier, you add a D12 to your pool, but you keep the highest result. Right, so you roll two d twelve and you keep the highest d twelve, mm -hmm. and that just that helps replicate. You're you're able to respond faster to a threat, and then once you have your initiative rolled out and you say you've got uh, uh, an eleven, right? Then at the table, you get to decide are you, when when and how many times you act. So do you act on an eleven? And you go damn near first, and you're going to spit out a burst fire or auto fire. Or you're going to throw grenades. You're going to take care of business. Or do you recognize that there's enough threats or like a hacker has to make actions in order you have to bypass a firewall, you have to breach the protocols, you have to go through all these things, you have to freeload your apps, right? Mm -hmm. And so then you have to look at, well, I have an 11, so now I can divide my initiative up into a number of segments, right, bait that can, they can't go higher than my total initiative but I can't repeat the same number twice. So I could act on a, a 10 and a one if I wanted to go first and I wanted to go last mm -hmm. and bring up the rear. I could act on a five and a six, uh, right? I, and there's any combination of, of, of whatever that initiative string adds up to your total initiative is how many times you get to act. 
Uh, and at first it seems like, well, why wouldn't I always go first? Or why wouldn't I take the most action? It's like, well, it really depends on the scenario at the table. And, you know, if you've got someone who's, you know, flatlining, and you're the only, you know, you're the medic and you have to hit them with an IFAC or you have to use your life after death module, you know, in order to bring them back up, you know, part of your paramedic training, that, that changes, that changes everything quite a bit. Like I mm -hmm. said, for hackers, you may need to take as many actions as possible because you need to clear the, the net run that you're on before the worst happens. Does that, does that explain it out pretty well yeah. or? Yeah, it okay. does. And so feed, <laughs> feel free to shit on it. <laughs> Um, now when it, now, um, I do, I just like that. I just like that the D12 is getting some love because so often that <laughs> die is the most shit on die in the entire role playing scene. Yep. Um, but since you, since you kind of hinted at, um, at cyberware and that, um, I do want to touch on that since obviously cyberware is, um, is a state is a staple with this, with, um, with cyberpunk, mm -hmm. um, I mean it's come it where it's coming into it came into an age when, um, cy when um, when by when um replacement part replacement body parts were starting to be a little bit less bleeding edge than they than they were in in a decade before. Yeah, sure. Um, but for but a lot of times there's you there usually ends up being some sort of humanity cost or some different or something <laughs> like that or it's kind it's kind of funny that you've got an entire generation whose first introduction to cyberpunk was ghost in the shell and yet yeah. that whole full body cyberization if you were to try and do that in um shadow run or cyberpunk 2020 or what have you you couldn't do it because yeah. you'd end because you'd end up being an NPC, you'd either ha you'd either have zero essence, or you'd be a cyber zombie. Yep. And I'm cur now. Obviously, you need to have some ca some kind of catch, but I'm curious, what's your what's Neon Blood's take on the cybernetic part of a cyberpunk setting? So for us, like I said, the number one thing is we limit it by. Um, we limit the power levels by tiers, and so you might have people who are like, ah, I'm going to get all the things. Okay, cool. Um, but then as you get all the things, we have an uncanny valley mechanic. And some people won't care about it because you always got those people who think the shit's not important until you actually remember that you're playing in a cyberpunk game, which is a lot of social interaction, right? Mm -hmm. So for if you buy your cyberware, it may be like one cipher, which is we use it, uh, cryptocurrency in the game. Um, if you, it's your, your cyber eyes might be one cipher, but if you don't add the hum like a humanity to them, which is another cipher, then you're taking a negative one to interactions with other humans because we're still hardwired for an uncanny valley approach. And anything weird, even if we see it, still throws us off at a core, right? Prostheses have been around for a long time, mm -hmm. but there's still that tingle in the back of your lizard brain when you see someone with a prosthetic, right? And it's not a judgment call. It's just... It's how that it, it, it's how it hits you, and so with cyberware, we wanted to really capture that of like, yeah, you're looking in someone's big giant fucking mechanical eyes, and they're doing like camera lens shifts and stuff, and that would be unsettling. Yeah. And so if you don't, if for every piece of cyberware you buy, just about except for the internal system stuff, you have to think about okay, I'm spending, and you know, you don't get a lot of cipher in this game. We also wanted to give a lot of reasons of why are we adventuring? You know, why do we keep making all this money, why are we doing the things? Well, because you're going to have to figure out your cyberware situation, and we'll, we'll cover the part two here in a second. Mm -hmm. So every, every piece of cyberware that's external that you buy, you need to watch that uncanny valley. And like I said, some people are like, well, I don't care if I've got a negative five to my you know, interactions with other people. Well, you know, you, you might at one point. Um, and I, would, I always encourage the GMs, like, whenever someone thinks they've got a one-up on you, then you should always utilize whatever you can to get them in front of uh, someone else to prove a point. Mm -hmm. Right, fair or unfair, it just is what it is. I don't like the I don't like the zombie street samurais that just walk around thinking that they don't ever, they never have to socially interact. That's just stupid. Although um, I do have to one I do have to wonder if there's the possibility where that um where that whole uncanny valley modifier could could apply both ways. Like um, say you, say you've got somebody who's just completely decked out. They'd look like in in um twenty in twenty twenty they'd look like a so, they'd look like a solo. Right, yeah. You know, just de just decked out the and um they're what um what if they were rolling to say intimidate um 
do you suppose that the uncanny valley thing might be might be um, used in reverse instead of a negative modifier as a positive one? Yeah, that's sort of the intention of it. It's supposed to be a. a it's supposed to be that. Ne it's a. It's a negative modifier, but it can. It can be addition by subtraction, mm -hmm. right? If you're trying and intimidate, um, if someone, if you, if you know someone's nervous, right? They may have a phobia. Um, it, it's really and that comes in that cyberpunk genre of research and knowing your targets and knowing who you're dealing with and knowing your fixtures. But yeah, that's 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 uh, definitely how I would play it, and that's how it probably should be played. Yeah. Um, and then on the other end of it, we remind people that all this cool shit you have, uh, there is cyberware debt because your cyber eyes aren't aren't you know one cipher literally. That's just to get you in the game started. But at the end of a scenario, right, at the end of a run, right, you do upkeep and there's debt and there's maintenance to your cyberware. And so based on the tiers that you have installed, you actually owe an upkeep cost. So like if you've got five tiers of cyberware, that's a D6 in Cypher that you owe at the end of an adventure. Just for maintenance, upkeep, you're lean, right? Because you're talking about, you know, $60,000 eyes. You know, these companies aren't going to suddenly have, you know, a, a, a benefactor <laughs> to them. There's no benevolence to they, they're, they're mega corporations for a reason mm -hmm. and they want to keep you going and keep you coming. And, you know, there is a real threat and it's in it's, it's discussed in the end of the cyberware section. Like, well, what if I don't pay my debt? Oh, OK, well, that company can begin to turn your shit off remotely. Right. Mm -hmm. Or if you try to shield yourself, then they actually will send out what they call reinvestment agents. Uh, and those are repo men. Yeah, I was, just, I, was just about to, I was just about to br bring that kind of thing up because there's been a few times in certain different um, cyberpunk campaigns where I have used as a not necessarily a bee bag, but as a um, as a dra as a dragon that you have to run away from the repo man from Repo the Genetic Opera. Yeah, right. Yeah, same kind of thing, right? And it's not it's not right away like. You have them. You have the debt maintenance, and if you fail to do it the first time, you know suddenly your critical failure rates can go up mm -hmm. by a natural one through four. Suddenly, right? Your smart gun's not firing correctly, and you're just like, "What the fuck's happening?" So that might be a side adventure. It might be some way taking care of that. The second time you fail, they're basically giving you disadvantage to almost everything that you do with that cyberware. The third time you don't pay your bills and you're late, that's when they send their reinvestment agents out to you know have a chat about what's real, what's right. Yeah. Um, and but and that and of course that chat is usually in the language of punch. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know the the other universal language. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a real shame if we had to rip your eyes out. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that that's part of the setting too. Is you're meeting those folks who are you know, you know, they've been their former cyberware owners, and now they're begging for you know whatever digital currency you're willing to you know, show their way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Speaking of that, let's talk about combat. Now, mm -hmm. you're aiming for combat being being very brutal, very deadly, where where one bullet yeah. away could le could lead to your death. And yep. The um now the obvious question when it com when it comes to that is when we're t when we're talking dead when we're talking deadly, are we t are we talking a ca are we talking a case where um, a bad a bad bit of RNG can fuck you over, or do you are you using a wound system, or how are you making the combat to that level of deadly? So it has hit points, right? We we use hit points, but the hit points are they're not going to go very high. You're going to have like say our agent right is not the the Krieg is our 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 solo right or Street Samurai. Uh, they have D12 hit points. And that's, that's it, plus constitution. And the only way to getting more hit points in the game is when you get 13 experience points, you get to do an upgrade to your character. And one of the upgrade choices is I want more hit points. And mm -hmm. so your starting hit points are pretty much where you're going to stay, right? Because humanity is frail. That's just the reality of it. I mm -hmm. can take a paring knife and shove it through someone's breastbone into their heart. It's only four inches of cheap, cheap, of cheap tin, right? And then you're dead. Um, but then on top of that, we have the armor system, which allows you to have the armor on. You can ablate incoming fire if that's your choice. You can take the fire. We have cover, and the cover works fairly straightforward the same way. Um, when everything has diminishing returns as you choose to use it, the gunplay is where it becomes a little weird. Like 
uh, could a low life gangbanger, you know, who is essentially would roll a D four for damage. Could they end a Krieg during a gunfight? Not likely in the, with one gunshot, but if you put a machine gun like an SMG or a shotgun in their hands, then it's a different conversation, right? So yes, that level of lethality is there. And that's why I wanted to build in the choices that the player has of like, hey, this is happening. This dude has an SMG. He's flipped that sucker over to full auto or burst fire. And that, you know, in burst fire in this game, you take advantage on the damage rolls, mm -hmm. you know, and if he's acting multiple times, you're going to start pump getting rounds pumped into you. So what are we doing about that? So it encourages the use of cover. It encourages the use of armor dermal plating things like that yeah uh, yeah I mean, it can be very deadly it, it can be very very deadly i've seen a creed go down in one round actually in one action uh as they got a shotgun leveled at their chest and the shotgun does multiple dice of damage at close range and when it comes when it comes to when it comes to um damage in combat Mm -hmm. There's always a bit of a balancing act when it comes to these kind of games to make sure that in the debate between whether to go melee or whether to go ranged, one doesn't <laughs> outshine the other. Because obviously, if you're if you're going to be talking straight up damage, um, if you're if you're dealing just a straight numbers game, it, unless this is done properly, um, people are going to go for um, ranged weapons and probably go for the biggest ranged weapons they can afford. Sure. And, well, that well, that might be um, realistic. It's not exact. I wouldn't exactly call it engaging because then then you basically have a giant every encounter as a giant sniper battle. And um, yeah, well, that can be fun for a one off. Having that be the default for encounters <laughs> wouldn't be all that interesting. Right. So I'm curious what I'm curious how you have it so so that um, ranged weapons aren't going to be outclassed, but aren't going to Okay, outclass melee weapons. Uh, so if you look at you know going through the book, so it's a tough one, right? Because it's it's, it's cyberpunk, mm -hmm. and yeah, we all want the Nova, you know, the fire katanas and the you know the mono the monomolecular whips and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some of the really cool melee weapons uh, that are in there, and. For firearms, uh, yeah, you can have, like, if you don't do a single action, right, if you're not just pulling the trigger one time, mm -hmm. any other mode, rapid fire, burst fire, and auto fire, remove your ammo. And our loadout for a character, you only get so many blocks to your character uh, for loadout, right? It's nine squares. And some weapons take up more than one square. So, like, you have, a say, a submachine gun. That submachine gun eats up two squares, and you still have to buy ammo, and ammo is one square. And if you go burst fire or full auto, then you, you start marking ammo, right? Mm -hmm. Which is just an abstracted way of saying, like, this isn't literally just three rounds coming out. This is you coming up, burst, 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 you know, trying to get on target. And that attack roll represents, hey, this is the, this is the part that is going to land something or stress them the fuck out, mm -hmm. shatter the wall, scare them. Um, to do the abstraction of hit points, but you're marking ammo. And so eventually the ammo runs dry just because of the limitations of, we wanted to have that simulation like with the OSNR is like, you can't just carry around five long guns and three pistols and it's going to be a good day for you. That's just not realistic. So when you equip your character, you're equipping your character based on the narrative that you formed around, well, I'm, I'm an agent. My background is personal, personal security details. So I carry an SMG, a pistol, uh, ammo times two for each one of those and an IFAC on my back and a Karam bit at my side, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I may have a space free or body armor, right? Is yeah. another two spacer. So you're down to only one space free and you're just like, oh shit, is that going to be ammo? Is that another IFAC? What am I going to do? And you start making those hard choices. Yeah. Uh, and then the other differentiation is while well, the, the two-way range, you know, it's a fairly static bonus, right? Your defense is your defense and that's yeah. That's that simulation of rounds are popping off, but you're not just standing still. You know, it's not a video game where you're waiting for the bullets to come in. Mm -hmm. We assume that people are ducking, dodging, taking me, coming up, you know, trying to find their best way of getting around things. Oh, yeah. Um, but we, right. So, but uh, I don't know if you read the, sec the section on how melee works. Melee is not a static bonus, melee is, in fact, an opposed role. 
And so we it went a completely different direction than most games where it's still, you got to hit my armor class with your sword. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, whatever. And if you do, whatever. No, nah, we made melee because I wanted to get that John Wick style where if you think about martial arts, mm -hmm. right, it's not just I'm going to punch at you, you're going to punch at me. It's no. a flurry of action. You're trying to get in there. You're trying to find those. And you're hitting bone. You're kicking the shit out of each other. And so that's why we made an opposed role. And on top of that, Cherry is if you can, if you, if you're the attacker and you win the role, you do the damage. Mm -hmm. If you're the defender, then you obviously win the role and you defend. But if you tie the role, you both take, uh, you both take half the damage. So both parties get to roll to represent that. You know, I'm punching fist to fist. We're hitting our shin to shin, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I will, ad I will admit that if it. If that approach was if that approach wasn't brought up, one thing that I what one thing that I had considered is the minimum damage rule that's in starts without number, mm -hmm. where even if even if you're even if in that case even if your attack go um gets blocked by their def by their defense, there is a, there is a certain amount of damage that you still end up taking. It, it's not going to be as much as if you got hit, but you're still you're still going to get whittled down. Yep. Um. Yep. Yeah, no, and it's, it makes sense in like our and our, our handheld weapons. If you're using like the our future primitive stuff, right? So tomahawks, blades, nova katanas, yeah. they also have they almost all have a defensive rating, right? So that's going to add into you being able to defend yourself um, appropriately, and so that's it's you know again it's part of it. Yeah, and the other th it's it's interesting that you bring up so something like um jo something like John Wick. Especially, especially since with with something like with something like that, I you have you have a whole lot more emphasis on essentially smaller arms. Um, mm -hmm. It's, I mean, we've we've had some emphasis on smaller arms in in fiction, especially in especially in the advent of of uh, John Woo, or for or for the gamers among among you, meh. Among us, Max Payne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but even even with even even with that, the other thing that's that's all that's often overlooked in the matter is is ha is doing combat in those tight quarters instead of just having it exchanging um, damage rolls mm -hmm. and just seeing who can who can whittle each other down first. Because again, you look at a com you look at a combat encounter in that or in any or in any sort of tr any sort of um training visual and it's never it's always a case of dancing to see who's gonna get the advantage first yeah basically right yeah and you start combining all of this with how we do our initiative and then like I said once once someone plays the game at least one time you start to realize the initiative count really really matters at that point yeah uh, probably more than in most games. I think part I think part of the reason why it ends up mattering in bo in both Neon Blood and in OS Plus R is the is the fact that your spot in initiative is not assumed. Right. <laughs> um, like a lot of a lot of cases, everybody rolls initiative, and that's largely the way the initiative is go the initiative turn order is going to be for the duration of the encounter. Yeah, that's so boring. And the only <laughs> the only other major um exception that i can think of from a bit from a large scale rpg was the tides of battle rule in l5r third edition and that and that was a case of cer of certain attacks allow you allowing you to um steal initiative um okay yeah and of course, there was the whole there's the whole fighting for initiative thing that Exalted Third did, but I didn't care for that because you had people um, hoarding. Yes, of course, right. Um. I mean, even even with Neon Blood, we have a a, a, a combat option called Make and Ready, mm -hmm. and it's essentially delay action. But you know, it's you can wait to go. But if you're waiting to go and it's someone else that that initiative round that initiative action sequence comes up right so if it's like a five and you go you still have to look at the resolution of because it's considered a tie with anyone also acting on that on that that number and so if you're trying to get to a if you're waiting for the hacker to be exposed 
you know, so you can shoot him and you're going to go at the same time the door opens and the hacker is there, you're going to lose that battle because one of the first questions we had from a test group was, like, well, how come computers move slower than gunfire? And I was like, fair enough. So I had to go out and type out, like, look, computers are moving at the speed of thought in this game, and then we'll go from there. And so I was like, no, you're going to – if you make ready and you delay your action, right, because you think you're going to be clever – you have to be aware that you getting your hand raised to fire a weapon is not going to go faster than that hacker who's trying to seize control of your of your personal area network to disable your smart gun. And speaking of speaking of that, the whole personal area network thing. Um, yeah. What was the impetus for for putting in that as one of your core pillars with a lot of the design? So looking at modern day, right, I mean, everyone has a pan around them with your smartphone, right? It's just you have your smartphone, people connect it to their watches, some folks have it to their, uh, their headphones. So you got these connected devices, and I'm like, well, let's take that out to a 2035 where my, my pan also, because all, all, all your, your pan is operated just like uh, the neural net or node meshes where there's a, what we call A2I, which is AI to the second power, right? It's, it's a... It's a advanced AI. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, a, this A2I is in your pen and it controls, all right, well, your ident, which is uh, your phone, your digital wallet, your social credit score, your actual credit score, your, your resume, everything about you that's in that ident you carry with you. It connects that. If you've got cyber eyes, you can connect to that. If you've got an uplink chip modification so you can wirelessly connect to the mesh, which is the neural net, it control it connects to that. If you've got a smart gun link, it can connect to that and put the HUD up on your eyes. If you've if you have a drone, it can connect to all these parts of your body. Uh, and so I wanted to have this like, because most hacking is uh, just it seems so boring and so mm -hmm. long form, and I didn't want that. So I'm like, look, I want hackers to be able to hack and hack a mesh. Mm -hmm. and basically enter in their own two-way range and have fun with it. And also other people can be like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, load your app, load your app, load your app. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted, well, what if I wanted to have a hacker that I want to shut down the, the op for soldiers cyber eyes so he goes blind? Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, well, how do I do that? And that's where the pan come into it is now you got your hacker making broad, broad decisions that are like, I'm in the mesh but my team is getting the shit kicked out of them. Shit, I'm going to offload a botnet, right? So I'm going to downgrade some of my my potential so I can come up out of the mesh, which there's three states of, of, of being in the mesh, right, as a hacker. I can maybe come into a suspended state and take on the enemy pan and try to get through that in a quick hacking exercise to shut them down or, you know, turn off the lights or... Because, you know, it's also... That's part of it, right? There's all these things and you can... It's, it's basically... If you play Watch Dogs 2 and all these spider webs come out, that's how you have to visualize it. Like there are so many lines of the internet connecting to every connected device and smart device that's out there. And the hacker is basically that thief, that source worth thief who's walking those tight ropes. Uh, but they just do it fast. Um, so that's where the pan comes into it. And I wanted to have, again, those decisions of like, shit, I got to get the data. My team's getting the shit kicked out of them. Ah, damn it. What do I do? All right, now I'm going to start degrading my own position or they can take care of themselves kind of thing. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and admit, admittedly, hacking is one of those things that a lot of people have tried and only and a lot less people have managed to get right. Because in the worst yeah. case scenario, you have um, Shadowrun 3rd Edition where hacking Ugh. had its own initiative count. So when yes. the hacking was going down, everybody, um, the hacker and the GM were basically playing duet while everybody else is just, yeah. sit, is just sitting with their thumbs up their ass. Right. And I wanted to avoid that because that's pretty much it. Right. You either get no one wants to play the hacker. So you just have to get an NPC and you're like, OK, well, they're getting the shit and you just wrote, narrate it. Or, yeah, what you said. Right. Is it's I, I remember Shadowrun as well. And it's like, well, I guess the Decker is going to do all the shit for the next five hours. So let's just sit here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I wanted to try to break that and make everything happen simultaneously and with as much fun as and danger sense is possible. Um, I think so. Of course, I think I think I captured that um, with the amount of hacking options that you can get into. And you know, there's hacking, there's person to person hacking, and I've got counter hacking. I've got hard port access. We have decrypting. Um, you can even lock someone into uh, what we call we, we refer to hacking as VX mm -hmm. in an homage to uh, you know the old. Um, 
virus database. And uh, you can interrogate folks, uh, all kinds of things you can do as a hacker in this game. That you're not just limited to some silly shit. And like I said, you can go, you know, of various states and how you want to hack. And that will make a difference as well. If you're just using your uplink and you're going straight into it and you're still walking around and moving and trying to shoot guns. Okay, cool story. You know, that's going to, that'll put you at uh, some penalties. If you want to go suspension, then you're going to be like, oh, you're kind of sitting in a corner and you're, Still aware, but any actions in the meat world are going to be penalized by your actions in the neural net are faster and easier. And then there is using what we call a T rig in the game, which is a it's short for a T rig means a, a, a torpor rig. Mm -hmm. And that's just a big dentist chair where they hook your ass into it and you go full immersion into the VX environment and you are flying at the speed of thought at that point. Mm -hmm. And it's. The fact that you've described it as this sort of spider web is definitely interesting since a lot of um, a lot of cyberpunk games that still use hacking are still going with that whole diving into a alternate dimension and all but none <laughs> approach that we that we yeah. uh, that we saw that we saw with that we saw with the internet um, in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, Johnny Mnemonic style. You know, yeah, it's just like now. <laughs> Fuck that! Yeah. Fuck that! Some people are still having the lawnmower mind mindset, including the god awful CG from that movie. Oh god, yeah, true. <laughs> and that's the thing is, I wanted to include a few throwback homages. So, like, yeah, you know, a hollow, a hollow synth is, you know, our 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 version of AR plus VR plus holographic technology that's reached a point where it's a hollow synth and depending on where your levels are and how you interact with the environment, you might just sit in a corner and drool as you're being overwhelmed with all these, you know, sexy ads and drinky ads and all this shit. So, and if you look at the neural net, how we have it described is the broad global internet. But if you're say, I don't know, let's see if you're, that's the broad, the neural net is the broad internet, right? It's, it's a globally controlled thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're going into, say, I don't know, like a 7-Eleven, the 7-Eleven, it has a mesh, a local mesh, that is definitely set up as an homage, but it also makes more sense that these businesses and kiosks and corporations would establish a mesh that it basically sells them, right? So when you're in there, your ads are going to be, your, your Holosynth ads are going to reflect like Disney ass characters trying to sell you Twinkies and shit. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you're a hacker going into that, you know, there is that, there is a draw to that where you, you might start to feel as you start to slip, right. And you start to get into the, a deeper immersion state where those, that Holosynth can be turned against you uh, by the A2I that, you know, ultimately you're probably going to encounter when you, uh, when you hit enough failures or you start going through those nodes mm -hmm. and then, you know, that can become a danger as well. Yeah. Now, within within Neon Blood, you've you've established six roles, which are basically this basically this um, game's version of classes, and each of them yeah. having their own little um sub little subtypes. Mm -hmm. I'd I'd like to I'd like to um go through uh, go through the uh, roles and just sure. since you since you're as familiar with other sh with other cyberpunk games as as I am. Um, I'd like you to go into which ones that which which um archetypes in other games these roles might be analogous to, and I'll start with the with the one at the top, and that is agents. Agents. All right. Uh, I would say agent is probably closest to. So this might make a lot of people mad and surprise people, but I am not a big fan of Cyberpunk 2020 nor Cyberpunk Red. I love Shadowrun. Um, so I would say they're closest to the bodyguard archetype. Mm -hmm. um, and ne next is Anarchs. You know, the Anarchs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the, um, you know, the, pe the, uh, pe the people who were, pr who were probably the fir probably first to fi first to fire brand, but last to actually pick up a gun. Yeah, yeah, they're definitely, uh, I mean, criminals archetype, right? It's a criminal, it's a ganger, mm -hmm. um, but they can be more than that. And like you said, each role has three backgrounds that they are provided in the book. And so like, you know, one of the ganger backgrounds, one of the anarch backgrounds is literally ganger. So you're gangbanger and we have a gang generation system, so you can just make your shit up on the fly. Mm -hmm. But then terrorist is one of those things, right? So no bullshit terrorists where, you know, mm -hmm. 
and uh, you have been trained and taught how to, you know, facilitate terror uh, for you know, political act, political gain. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, they're they're pretty straightforward. Yep. So next, or mafia. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd I'd be he- I'd be hesitant to have some to have somebody at my table run a run a mafia anarch because I don't I don't want them <laughs> doing a Marlon Brando impression. Of course, you I, know you know it's coming. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know it's coming, and my, and part and part of my job is always risk assessment. So I got so I have to find a way to minimize the risk. Um, when it com- um, when it comes to met when it comes to medic, um, I'd I'm guessing that's gonna, I'm guessing that's going to be analogous to. I know you're I know you're not a fan of um sh- oh cyberpunk, but the do- the uh, docks or in Shadowrun the uh, dock wagons. Mm-hmm. Dock wagon, yeah, trauma team kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really would depend on too where you're of your background, right? So, like, we've got the combat medics, which are kind of represent independent duty corpsmen or mm-hmm. pararescuemen from the military. Uh, your straight EMTs, right? So, triage nurse or corporation med techs, uh, or survivalists is one of the options where you either retired or you're one of those separatist people and you've kind of learned all this shit on your own because the world is a giant shithole and you're ready for the end of things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, again, player choice and how you perceive the world and how you choose to interact with it. Yeah. And Jockey, when I saw when I saw the description <laughs> for that one, I immediately went, Rigor. It's yeah, a, of course, it's right? Rigor. Yeah, yeah, you got to have it. It's just their emphasis is less on cars and more on because I think the original rigor gave the impression they were more focused on big giant vehicles. There was right, the there original. was a rigor variant. There there um there's been a rigor variant for dro- for that specifically mm-hmm. focused on drones for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I I know first edition Shadowrun had the drones, but it just it never struck me that rigor was really focused on drones, and I don't know why. I could have been young, mm-hmm. but yeah, jockey here. The biggest emphasis on on drones. Um, I'm a big droner, and I got two fucking drones sitting in the corner right now. Um, and I wanted to bring that in there, but there is also the potential of, you know, you're, you're also, you know, a jockey for uh, actual full size vehicles and you've turned those into living, you know, or I guess big drones yeah. uh, as a, you know, with some hacking skills thrown in, you know, the jockey is also more than capable. Well, technically everyone can hack if they have the right gear um, and they, you know, the skills are, Anyone can use any skill, but mm-hmm. some are better at it than others. Yeah, and when it comes to Krieg, the vibe I get from that is the solo, the street samurai, um, yep, that sort that sort of thing. Basically, the basically the the sole thing that the sole thing that they're good they're they're good for is ma- is making sure that the that the um, enemy opposition is not, is is in a strong need of a of a good old fashioned deadening. Yeah, basically, right. And again, you, it's it's how you approach it based on the arc, the the background for the archetype that you look at. I mean, we even put a cultist in there, which we call the you know the Sicario. Uh, and there, and every every ba- I should say every background has a special talent. Like the roles all have special talents. Mm-hmm. Ha- have a talent that they're good at, like the medic. Uh, well, actually, yeah, the medic is a fair one to start with. So the medic has the talent of T triple C, right? So you can heal someone hit points right no big deal mm-hmm. so and the backgrounds also have a talent and that and the krieg is yeah how do you want to play that um their talent is make shit dead and then for the backgrounds it can get kind of weird especially for the sicario uh, it's basically penitent and you willingly take damage but you turn that damage into gaining advantage for the rest of the initiative round mm-hmm. which is pretty potent actually yeah now when it comes now um when it comes to it, when it comes to advancement within within mm-hmm. the within these roles, um, are you going aside from the aside from the uh, starting point with your role and background? Is it largely free for, Is it largely free form when it comes to advancement? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it, it probably looks really familiar for anyone who has OS and R. Um, I I want. I've I've never liked people being hard locked into stupid shit they don't care about. So I'm like, you know, and so you, a medics has a medic has a threat die lower than a Krieg, right? A Krieg is going to do more damage, 
with anything they pick up, right? Just because of training and ability. A medic just isn't trained to kill. That's not really how they how they operate. But if you're going through these runs and you're like, you know what, my medic is going to get really good at firing guns, and then you start, to, then you can start using those upgrades, and it doesn't. You're not locked out of that because your character class says so, and you're going to only get good at healing and keeping people alive. You, we, we don't lock you into a, a you know a strong stereotype. We want you to grow. Mm-hmm. And when and given that given that given that there is there is one question that I had regarding skills because this is one of this is one of the big pet peeves I've had with a lot of skill based systems. Mm-hmm. Um. I'm assuming that when it comes to knowledge, you keep that as simple as possible. Uh, yeah, we have a common sense. Mm-hmm. So if it's something that your character would probably know because they live in 2035 and you don't, it's just a wisdom check with advantage, mm-hmm. right? Because it makes the most sense. You're like, oh, okay, cool. And then, and then the GM can tell you something uh, that you probably would know, but the GM may not be sure that you should know it. Um or we have an academic skill, which is it's it's yeah very straightforward. Like, okay, I'm gonna do some research. Oh, okay, cool. Make an ac- academics role. Okay, well, let's tell you what you find. Yeah, I didn't want to get into academics, chemistry, academics, botany. It was just like, no, stop. That shit's so boring. Who cares? You know, abstract it out and make it fun. Well, it's, it's not it's not only the fact that it's boring, but it also creates bloat. Mm-hmm. Because. What you effectively have is the same skill replicated um, <laughs> dozens upon dozens of times, without with and the and the um sk- and the more that you replicate, the more um situational it's going to be. And yep, absolutely. Yeah, I it's, concur, man. It's um, it's also it's also putting a lot of faith in the GM that the that. That 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 singular topic is actually going to get use in the campaign. Which there's no, um, right? I don't know about you, but I don't have a crystal ball. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, if you look at someone's character sheet, and you're like, "Oh, great! You took fucking botany. Awesome! Now I got to make adventures at least once or twice every couple of sessions of revolver." You know, and it's very limit. I think it's just very limiting, like you said. It's mm-hmm. it's it's very restraining. Whereas this, it's like, well, I don't know. Fuck, we're going to want an adventure. Let's see what happens. Cool, you can use your academics for that because it makes sense for your character. Yeah, you know, and like I said, do anything, and the skills are either trained or untrained, and. That can make a difference. Um, basically, untrained is raw talent, and you're just going for broke. <laughs> uh, trained means you've actually you've actually been trained, and you have a a little bit better chance than uh, than average of of succeeding. Yeah. Plus, if you if you look at the the skill set that's demonstrated by almost every pulp style character since the 1920s, yeah. Whenever you try and put them onto a sheet, you've got them. You've <laughs> imagine, imagine just for instance, just just for the fuck of it, um, having to list off all the different sk- all the different um, knowledge skills that, say, Sherlock Holmes would ha- would have right. reasonable access to. You'd have a you'd have a character sheet like five pages long. Yep, absolutely, man. Like I said, I come from a role master background back in the day, and it was crazy. It was so long; it took a whole day to just make a character, and it's just silly. I mean, I, I get it. But I don't want that level of verisimilitude. I want abstraction so we can have, you know, fun and we can shoot guns and hack and just be silly. Yeah. You know, even language. I, 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 so I'm a, I'm a philologist by, by profession. So I get a little nerdy with language because I'm like, nah, speaking fucking seven languages isn't really as easy. Being a polyglot's not like everyone thinks it is. I speak yeah. three languages and some work, working knowledge of a few, and it's still really difficult to maintain sometimes. Uh, some of what's going on in my head mm-hmm. so but even that we we tried to abstract linguistics out it's like look man just make this make sense and if you get into a if it's not a native language and the gm thinks it's a it's a complicated topic or you're not really sure make that roll right mm-hmm. and then have fun with it and now when it comes now um when it comes to when it comes to the my, the uh, micro campaign that you that you talk about Mm-hmm. Um, like in like when it comes just using that to introduce the system, are you are you treating that like a sandbox in terms of your in terms of your approach with that micro campaign? So not at first, right? And I I was just working on it actually, um, just last night trying to trying to get everything together on it, and it's like 
it, it, it comes right out and says, like, look, the prologue and act one are not railroady, but it functions with the assumption that your characters and who want to become glitches and conduct terrible shit against massively powerful corporations. So you're willing to follow breadcrumbs, right? So the prologue is a real quick, it's, it's a real quick a, a action scenario to get you used to how, how the guns work, how initiative works, how hacking can work um, real fast. The second part, the act one is all right, cool story. Yes. The setup. Yes. Things are going to go wrong, but it welcome to how cyberpunk works. Welcome to, you know, interacting and in, with this tech noir setting and all this junk, um, but have fun with it. And then once you get at, into act one, that's when it opens up and it's just like, Oh, what do you guys want to do next? You know, you have, you have your job, you have a gig, but now how do you go from, you know, what you just left to the gig because you can't just waltz into the, the company that they want you to, or maybe you can, right, without really understanding what you're dealing with, what you're going to need, what their, you know, what, what are their guard rotations. And so we sort of separate that out. And I include, um, in the military, we have a thing called SMEAC, and it's how we plan operations. And so I mean, I'm including that flow list chart. So GMs can look at it and be like, oh, okay, this makes sense. What's our situation? What's our need? What's our go, no go signal? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be able to help people understand, like, hey, this is how we do things in the real world when it comes to potential loss of life. You know, what are the enemies? What are the friendlies? What are our frequencies that we operate on? Have we thought of all these things? Mm -hmm. And they can use that, and the characters can use, the players can use that to be like, oh, let's let's also think about this shit. You know, how many how many of these blinks can we fill in by doing the groundwork, gathering intelligence, uh, scouting the area, shit like that. Now, when it com when it comes to you mentioned earlier about about a uh, random gang generation thing, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm curious if you, if there's gen if there's going to be a section that just has a bunch of different uh, random generation setups so that people can fill in the blanks about personalizing their vision of 2035. Uh yeah. So we have. So we're close to unlocking the micro sprawl kit, which will really open that up. Um, and that will be a, a big thing, but we have essentially it's a, it's a 10 by 10 grids, right? You can roll on them. We, we have the little, we tell you how to do that. So it's street gangs, scene locations, right? So you can roll the dice and be like, Oh, you're standing next to a media front for some random influencer, things like that. So you can really start populating the world around the characters. You can say like, Oh, this city block would have, I don't know, five kiosks of something. Let's find out what they are. Mm -hmm. uh op four so and it's not just op four is just a generic term for non non-player characters that you meet mm -hmm. and so it's like oh well who's on the street all right well let me make a few rolls and then when you're in the when you're in the net and you're doing the runs and you start looking at hackable assets i don't need the gm to always be like ah fuck i gotta plan everything out now you can use this quick table it'll be like oh there's um you know, like uh, four or five things. And I'm gonna make. I'm gonna roll those real quick. Oh, look, there's a maintenance drone that you you can you you have access to. There's a fire alarm system. There's a 3D printer on someone's desk and things like that. Um, so yeah, we definitely have that out there. And that's included in the book. And like I said, then the the sprawl kit will open that up even further to help folks really understand. Like, oh, okay. How do we do business? How do you de determine the streets and what's on the street? How many buildings and how many entrances and exits there would be from the streets um so i think we should unlock that knock on wood i mean i'm still going to work on it because i'm that level of nerd um and then we also include some external links that help people uh generate names of things um link out to like some of the sites for some of the better audio things that you can grab um the faces of the dystopia there's a website that makes fake fucking people Mm -hmm. right so we link to that of like hey if you don't know what a person looks like who they're talking to you just click this link and it's going to give you a random randomly generated deep fake of a human being that looks real but it's not a real person um so yeah and with all, with all that all, all that put all that put together now i i do want to congratulate you on the fact that at the time of this recording you're at um a little a little double over your initial goal um, yeah. at, at currently at twenty eight hundred dollars at the t at the time of this recording, with um with just sixteen days to go. Yeah. What are you shooting for as far as a release window? So, 
I gave it till September because like I said, in the Kickstarter near the bottom, I was up front and like, look, I've been that person where you don't get shit and I know how people feel when they don't get shit on time. Mm -hmm. So I said September. I honestly think it can be earlier, um, especially for the PDF. Uh, The PDF will probably be out by May, uh, knock on wood, you know, for the main rule book. uh, It's getting everything else together for the unlocks and stuff that uh, we may need. But the main rule book, I could I could see it by May because uh, I'm just I, I can write like I said almost full time in the evenings, and then um, <clears throat> if not, then maybe a little bit back. And then the, the the book itself just takes layout, and you know that's just the hard part. And you've seen how the PDF looks, and mm-hmm. you know my layout dude, he's just like this is doable, but goddamn you, <laughs> and it's not crowded, right? I mean. It's no. it's I, I've had nothing but positive feedback from people. I was really nervous about the one very specific aspect of it, uh, but everyone I talked to, they're like, "No, that's fucking cool," and it doesn't. There's the contrast doesn't hurt the eyes too much, at or at all. Mm. Um, and you get the cool neon lines around it and shit. So, and in a yeah, weird man. way, in a weird way, it kind of reminds me of of some of the layout of of sites I would have seen if I was um go, if I was going <laughs> around in um ni- in ninety nine or something. <laughs> Yeah, man, Angel Fire, GeoCities. <laughs> oh god, don't give don't even give me start on fucking Angel Fire. <laughs> um, but with all, but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come back up to the temple. No, man, easy day. Thank you for entertaining me, and hopefully, I mean, hopefully you liked what you saw from you know. The preview well, that you, I gave you. I definitely like. I definitely like the fact that you have a level of navigation that so many other people don't. Like, seriously, people, <laughs> hyperlinks are a thing these days. Use them on your PDFs. <laughs> yeah. Your, did you so? Did you, did you play with the menu that goes across the top of the page? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so a bunch of my players didn't know that worked, and they're like, "Wait, what?" And I was like, "Touch the fucking thing for combat." And they're like. Oh shit! It has function. I was like, "Yes, of course it has function." <laughs> yeah, I um, if there's one person who's really been a, who's really been pioneering the whole integration of um, of hyper of hyperlinks into PDFs, it's um, it's it's Wade, you know, yeah. of, of um for, of the fragged games. Yeah, he does that with a lot of them, and he's the only person who I'll give a slight pass for. When it comes to my whole hatred of people who don't put indexes in their books, yeah, but you, yeah, if you do it right, you don't like. like yeah, I look at the table of contents and I'm like, do I really need that? I mean, the the whole book is fairly navigable, and, and on top of having bookmarked everything, you know, for a PDF reader, like, eh. I think I think having a table of contents is is a bit important because you don't know if somebody's looking at it through PDF or looking at it through print. Um, yeah. You just have to make sure you don't fall into the Palladium problem and have a table of contents filled with nothing but filthy fucking lies. <laughs> yeah, no, so far, so far my table of contents is, is pretty accurate. So I learned a lot of lessons. I got my ass reamed out online about lack of bookmarks and shit in OSNR. And I was like, it was my first game and I wrote it because I was arrogant. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this one I wanted to take a more time and a more loving approach to it to actually make a, a serious love letter to to the cyberpunk nerds and you know, kind of do it right for the system and to just create something a little more magical than, you know, I'm a, f- I am, I'm a fighter with a, a machine gun, wink, wink, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> but, and anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. And as I always <laughs> say, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>